This chapter begins a review of the energy yielding nutrients, which if you recall are carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Chapter four corresponds with carbohydrates, and we're going to take a look at not only the chemical composition of the various carbohydrates, but also the way that they are more specifically digested and absorbed um, compared to what we went through in chapter three, as well as the health implications and recommendations as far as how much we should actually be consuming. The first thing we're going to take a look at is the chemical makeup of carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. They're linked together through chemical bonds and they're classified as being either simple or complex. You can imagine that simple carbohydrates are going to contain smaller amounts of these specific elements, whereas the complex carbohydrates are going to contain larger amounts. The first category we're going to take a look at are the simple carbohydrates, which consists of monosaccharides and disaccharides. The monosaccharides are single sugars and most of them are classified as hexoses which means that they have six sides to their structure. Their chemical makeup is six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. The way that the molecule is arranged actually is what determines how sweet or how much sweetness we can perceive from our taste buds when we consume these um, specific sugars. The first to note is glucose, which is the most essential energy source that our body needs. And there are certain areas within our body in which it is the preferential source. This includes our brain, nervous system, and red blood cells. Glucose is also the form of sugar that is transported through our bloodstream. So if one was to have a blood sugar level drawn, what is actually being checked is their blood glucose level. When you take a look at a food label, if you see the term dextrose listed, that's just another term that food manufacturers use to note that glucose is present in that particular food. Fructose is the sweetest of the monosaccharides. It occurs naturally in honey and fruits and is often added to other foods in the form of high fructose corn syrup. And we're gonna talk about high fructose corn syrup in a little bit more detail as we go on. As with glucose having another name when it's present in a food, the same thing applies to fructose. Food manufacturers will sometimes use the word levulose on an ingredient list to signify the presence of fructose. The third monosaccharide is galactose. And galactose is a little different than the other two in that it is not very, uh, very often found by itself in nature. Usually it exists combined with glucose to form lactose, lactose being a disaccharide. If we take a look at the chemical structures of these monosaccharides, note glucose and galactose. They are very similar in their arrangement of the molecule. The only difference is, as you can see, the placement of one single hydroxyl group. Fructose, on the other hand, is completely different. Whereas glucose and galactoses are referred to as hexoses, which again, remember, means six sides, fructose has five sides. So this is noted as being a pentose. Again, the way that the molecules are arranged is what determines how sweet they're going to be when we consume them. The arrangement of fructose stimulates the taste buds to produce a very sweet sensation. Again, when we consume some type of a food which contains, in this case, fructose. The second category of the simple carbohydrates are the disaccharides, which are two monosaccharides which are linked together. One of these monosaccharides is always going to be glucose. The first disaccharide to note is maltose. Maltose is a combination of glucose plus glucose. When starch is broken down in our GI tract, maltose is produced. Also when seeds germinate and also during the fermentation process, maltose is produced. The most notable form 
or food which contains maltose is barley. Sucrose is the second disaccharide and this is the combination of glucose plus fructose. Sucrose generally comes from the processing of both sugar cane and sugar beets. Table sugar or what we also refer to as white granulated sugar is sucrose. Depending on the processing method, however, however, other forms of sucrose may be produced, and these can include powdered sugar or brown sugar. The third disaccharide is lactose, and lactose is the combination of galactose plus glucose. This disaccharide is also referred to as milk sugar because it's the main sugar form that we find in both milk and milk products. The type of reaction that links monosaccharides together to form these disaccharides are referred to as a condensation reaction. The opposite type of a reaction, which would then split apart the disaccharide to the individual monosaccharides, is referred to as hydrolysis. Now let's take a look at an example of both of these types of reactions. The top part of the slide is the example of condensation. You can see glucose is being combined with glucose. A water molecule is going to be created from the removal of a hydroxyl group as well as an additional hydrogen atom. The resulting structure then is going to be the creation of a disaccharide, which in this case is glucose plus glucose equals maltose. The second example on the lower part of the slide is the opposite type of reaction or hydrolysis. This is where you will see the bond between a water molecule is broken along with the bond which had linked the two monosaccharides together. The result is going to be then two individual units of glucose being produced from the breaking apart of a maltose molecule. We took a look at the simple carbohydrates, which included the monosaccharides and disaccharides. Now we're going to move on to the next category, which are the complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are made up of either just a few glucose units linked together, or they may be many glucose units linked together to form very long strands. Those that only have a few Glucose units linked together are referred to as oligosaccharides. If there are many glucose units linked together, however, they're referred to as polysaccharides. These polysaccharides may consist of sugars linked in very straight organized chains, or they may be very highly branched with quite a bit of twisting and turning within the molecule itself. The polysaccharides that we will take a look at include glycogen, starch, as well as the fibers. The first category of complex carbohydrate is glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in both animals and humans. When we consume some carbohydrate source, that carbohydrate is broken down in our GI tract into glucose. The glucose, which isn't used immediately or for some particular function, will be stored in our body as glycogen. Your liver, as well as your muscle, will store this glycogen basically for future use. Because of the type of the bonding that occurs in these very highly branched chains, the glycogen can be broken apart very, very quickly whenever we need a source of energy which glucose can provide. Since glycogen is stored in muscles then, in both animals as well as in man, you would assume when we consume an animal source, whether it's beef, chicken, um, pork, whatever, it would provide us with some glycogen. That's not the case, however, because what happens is that the glycogen which is stored in the muscle of the animal when the animal is slaughtered, it's very quickly hydrolyzed or it's very quickly broken down. So the breakdown of the glycogen doesn't allow for any glucose then to be coming from that particular animal product. So it's not a significant source for us. The second category of complex carbohydrate is starch. 
Starch is the storage form of glucose that you find in plants. This starch is present in the plants to support the ability of the plant to grow, as well as to retain its structure. Depending on the type of plant, will determine if the glucose chains are going to be very long or are they going to be short. Also, is there going to be a lot of branching or is there not going to be too much branching? When we consume some type of a plant that contains starch, our body very easily can hydrolyze it or break it down once again into individual glucose units. We can then use that glucose as a source of energy. What are some good sources of starch? Well, predominantly we find them in grains. So you could think about things like barley, oats, wheat. Those are gonna be great sources of starch. Tubers are another source. Tubers include potatoes, whether they're white potatoes, sweet potatoes, or yams. And then also legumes. Legumes, which include things like dried peas, dried beans, they also are going to be a very concentrated source of starch. If we take a look at this slide, we can see an example of a glycogen molecule compared to molecules of starch. First of all, take a look at the glycogen molecule. You can see that there are hundreds of glucose units that are linked together in a very highly branched type of a chain configuration. Again, because of that high amount of branching, our body can hydrolyze or break down those individual units very, very quickly. Also notice that each new glycogen molecule is noted as needing a special protein to be present before the glucose units can actually be attached. Starch, on the other hand, doesn't need any type of special protein to start the chain. And these, uh, this slide gives you two examples of two different types of starches. And as you can see, they might be very um, compact, they might be long chains, there may be branching, or there may not be branching. It really depends, again, on the type of starch, what type of a plant it may be coming from. The third example of a complex carbohydrate are the fibers. Yes, fibers are polysaccharides, which means that they contain long chains of glucose units. However, they are different from, say, a molecule of starch. Fiber cannot be broken down in the GI tract. Humans actually lack the enzymes for this breakdown to occur. Fiber passes through our GI tract relatively intact. Even though there are definite health benefits to consuming fiber, and we'll talk about these in more detail in a bit, fiber is not a source of energy for humans. Let's compare a molecule of starch to a molecule of a fiber. In this case, the fiber is cellulose. If you look at the major difference, it has to do with the bonding between the glucose units. With a starch molecule, we have the enzymes present in our guts that can break apart those individual units. However, with fiber, again, in this case, the instance is cellulose, the bonding is different. And we as humans lack the particular enzymes that we need to break apart those glucose units. That's why fibers travel through our GI tract basically intact, not being able to generate a source of energy. The main reason we actually consume carbohydrate, whether it is simple or complex, is that we want to be able to use those individual glucose units that are present in the molecule. Monosaccharides are already single units, so nothing needs to occur as far as hydrolysis or breakdown of them. Disaccharides, if you recall, are two monosaccharides that are linked together. So this bond is going to have to be split. Starch, on the other hand, requires a much more complicated type of digestive process. To break starch down and then to finally allow glucose to be absorbed is much more complicated. 
we're going to follow the digestive and absorptive process of carbohydrate as it travels through the GI tract. The initial site of carbohydrate digestion begins in your mouth due to the presence of salivary amylase. The amylase that's present immediately will start to hydrolyze or break down the bonds between the glucose units that are present in a molecule of starch that we have consumed. As the carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth because of the salivary amylase, you may think that it would continue then as it would travel in the form of a bolus down the esophagus into the stomach. However, because of the high acidity, the presence of stomach acid, the salivary amylase actually becomes inactivated and carbohydrate digestion is going to cease as long as it is present in the stomach. The majority of splitting and absorption of carbohydrate molecules is going to then occur in the small intestine, as we noted in chapter three. In the small intestine, enzymes work to break down the longer strands of starch, the polysaccharides into disaccharides. Then there are even more specialized enzymes present, which break down these disaccharides further. Maltose is broken down because of the presence of maltase. Sucrose is broken down by sucrase. And lactose is, breaking, is broken down by lactase. And then there is also another specialized enzyme, which is known as pancreatic amylase, that's also present for the hydrolysis or the breakdown process. Once these disaccharides are broken down into the individual monosaccharides, these monosaccharides are then absorbed through the methods of active transport or facilitated diffusion. You could see glucose and galactose use the method of active transport, where fructose uses the transport method of facilitated diffusion. You can use this slide as a review of the whole process of starch digestion. Once again, starting in the mouth because of the action of the salivary amylase, ending in the small intestine where those monosaccharides that are released through the digestive process can finally be absorbed. On the right side of the slide, the steps involved in fiber traveling through the GI tract are reviewed. And we will go through that once again, specifically when we go through fiber. I mentioned that there are specialized enzymes which are found in the small intestine that are necessary to break down the disaccharides. One of these is the lactase enzyme, which is necessary to break down lactose. We often find, however, that this particular enzyme may not be produced in adequate amounts, leading to what's known as a lactose intolerance. The lactase enzyme is produced in the highest amount immediately after birth which is desirable since an infant's intake will consist of either breast milk or formula. Because of the higher amounts of the lactase enzyme, their digestive tract is equipped to handle the lactose which is present in either the breast milk or the formula. However, the lactase enzyme production declines as we age, with only about a third of the adult population producing adequate amounts. So what happens? Well, the undigestive lactose then becomes food for our own intestinal bacteria. And this in turn causes symptoms such as bloating, abdominal discomfort, and diarrhea. Besides advancing age, our intestinal cells can become damaged from certain types of diseases, some medications, as well as malnutrition, which in turn results once again 
in inadequate amounts of the lactase enzyme. Then there is also thought to be a genetic component. Lactose intolerance has been found to be much more common in those of Southeast Asian descent and much less common in those coming from Northern Europe. How do we then manage a lactose intolerance? Well, most individuals can consume up to about six grams of lactose, which is about a half a cup of milk without producing symptoms. Fermented milk products have had the lactose digested by the bacteria that are actually present in the particular food, so they also can be well tolerated. Foods like yogurt, kefir, cottage cheese would fall under that category. Then hard cheeses, aged cheeses, they have the lactose component removed during processing. Then there's other options. There is the use of what is known as lactate milk. This is milk which has had the lactase enzyme already added to it, so the lactose is broken down. You can also get tablets which contain the lactase enzyme that you can consume along with a milk or a milk product to break down the lactose which is present. One of the greatest issues with a lactose intolerance if someone is avoiding milk and milk products are potential nutrient deficiencies. And they include in this case, riboflavin, vitamin D, and calcium. So one wants to pay very close attention to making sure that they're getting these nutrients from other sources. We're going to take a very brief glimpse at carbohydrate metabolism, or what happens to carbohydrates, specifically glucose, after digestion and after absorption. I already mentioned that glucose is the preferential energy source for certain areas of our body. So it does have the function as the chief energy nutrient. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in both animals as well as human, and it's stored in our liver and in our muscle cells. If there is excess glucose, which is not made into glycogen and stored, that excess glucose is going to be converted into fat. Our body has the capability of being able to break down our glycogen stores when we need a source of glucose. It breaks down the glycogen molecule into the individual glucose units, and the glucose then is simply released into your bloodstream. What happens though if your glycogen stores get to the point where they are depleted and they can no longer offer a source of glucose? Well, your body's very efficient at using another process. This specific process is known as gluconeogenesis. And gluconeogenesis is the ability to be able to convert protein or protein stores into glucose. More specifically, it involves the amino acid components of the protein being turned into a glucose molecule. Ideally, we don't want this to happen. We don't want to be breaking down our muscle mass, which is what is containing the protein stores, into those individual amino acids to then in turn turn those into glucose. To avoid this from happening, what we want to do is make sure we're consuming adequate amounts of carbohydrate. Adequate carbohydrate consumption is the key to prevent protein or muscle breakdown. Suppose our glycogen stores are depleted and we're not consuming adequate carbohydrate. Our body then shifts into a different type of metabolism or specifically what's referred to as abnormal fat metabolism. With this metabolism, an alternative energy source is produced in an attempt for our body to spare further breakdown of our muscle mass. Ketones or ketone bodies are produced from fat fragments, and these can be used as that alternative source of energy. However, there is an issue if too many ketones eventually accumulate in your bloodstream. 
This is shifting you into a condition known as ketosis. And ketosis upsets the acid-base balance in the body, which involves the pH of your blood becoming too acidic. The major issue with ketosis is that it causes body proteins. So body proteins such as hormones, neurotransmitters, antibodies, to not be able to function appropriately. To spare body protein and prevent a severe case of ketosis, What's been recommended is to consume a minimum of 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrate per day. In upcoming chapters, we will go into more detail as far as the state of ketosis. We've noted that glucose is our preferred energy source in the body, and we want to make sure that we have an adequate amount available in our bloodstream at all times. We want to maintain what's known as glucose homeostasis. If there is a situation where you don't have an adequate amount of glucose in your bloodstream or you have a low blood glucose level, you can experience symptoms such as dizziness, headache, weakness, and so forth. On the other hand, if you have too much glucose in your bloodstream, you can experience symptoms such as confusion, headache, fatigue, and for those who have a longer period of time where your blood glucose is elevated, you can experience other symptoms such as vision issues, increased thirst, increased urination, those symptoms basically relating to the onset of diabetes. Any type of fluctuation, whether it is an elevation in blood glucose or a decrease in blood glucose, can actually take quite a toll on your body and body functions. What's involved in this glucose homeostasis or helping to keep our blood glucose levels constant? Well, there are two hormones which play a major role and these include insulin and glucagon. Insulin has the capability of moving glucose into your cells, which in turn then is going to lower your blood sugar or your blood glucose levels. Glucagon, on the other hand, brings glucose out of storage. So it plays a role in signaling to break down your glycogen stores to release glucose into the bloodstream. This in turn will raise your blood glucose or your blood sugar levels. Then there is also epinephrine, which can possibly come into play. It specifically will be enacted if you are in what is referred to as a fight or flight situation. This refers to maybe a situation where you are extremely stressed, you've experienced some type of trauma, or some type of an incident that requires glucose to be released very, very quickly. For everyday purposes, however, we basically rely mostly on insulin and glucagon. One of the main ways that we can ensure that we have um, adequate amounts of glucose in our system, or specifically our blood system at all times, is to consume balanced types of meals with adequate complex carbohydrates. Remember, it's those carbohydrates that are eventually broken down into the individual glucose units. When blood glucose regulation fails, the results therefore can be hypoglycemia or low blood glucose, hyperglycemia, which is elevated blood glucose, which in turn can lead to diabetes. Also note what the levels are for a fasting blood glucose or a fasting blood sugar, what the levels would be for someone possibly diagnosed with prediabetes as well as diabetes. The following two slides show how the body maintains this critical glucose homeostasis. This first slide in particular takes a visual view of the process itself. So let's follow how everything occurs step by step. When a person eats, blood glucose rises. 
which makes sense because after the nutrients go through the GI tract, in particular carbohydrate, it's broken down into glucose and it is released eventually into the bloodstream. In response to that elevation in glucose level, the pancreas will release insulin, also releases insulin into the bloodstream. That insulin that's released stimulates the uptake of glucose into the cells, as well as storing some of that glucose in the form of glycogen in both the liver as well as in the muscles. Insulin also has the responsibility of taking any excess glucose and allowing that to be converted into fat for storage. After several hours, after blood glucose levels start to decline, the hormone glucagon now does its job. A lower blood glucose stimulates the pancreas to release glucagon and ships it off into the bloodstream. This glucagon now stimulates the liver cells to break down the glycogen that's stored there and release glucose back into the bloodstream. With that release of glucose now, blood glucose levels will start to rise again. Here is basically a repeat of the previous slide visual just written out step by step. We know that dietary carbohydrate is important. So what foods can we select to provide us with this essential nutrients? Well, there's various groups or major sources of carbohydrate, and we're gonna take a look at these. The first group includes grains, cereals, pasta, rice, bread would also fall under this category. And they're gonna give you about 15 grams of carbohydrate per serving. They consists of complex carbohydrates, usually in the form of starch. So they're gonna require more digestion than say a simple carbohydrate would. The fruits are another major source of carbohydrate and they contain more so the simple carbohydrates. If you remember, fructose is actually referred to as being fruit sugar. This is the type of a monosaccharide that we predominantly are gonna find in various fruits. Fruits are comparable to the grains and the cereals and so forth as far as how much carbohydrate they provide per serving. In this case, it's also about 15 grams. It depends upon the specific fruit though as far as how much carbohydrate is in there per serving. Things like bananas, pineapple, mango, they tend to be higher in carbohydrate. They tend to have a larger amount of fructose. And if you remember, the fructose molecule causes our taste buds to perceive a higher amount of sweetness. And those types of fruits are sweeter than, say, grapefruits, plums, and blackberries they tend to have a lower amount of fructose or overall a lower amount of carbohydrate. Then we have the vegetables, which can vary greatly as far as the amount of carbohydrate present. Starchy vegetables, things like peas, potatoes, corn, they're gonna have closer to about that 15 grams per serving. Leafy vegetables, things like spinach, collard greens, and kale, they have a lower amount of carbohydrate, maybe closer to about five grams per serving. Milk and milk products are another source of carbohydrate, primarily in the form of lactose. Most servings of milk, whether it's whole milk, low fat milk, or skim milk, provide you with about 12 grams of carbohydrate, once again, in the form of lactose. Cheese, it really depends. Hard cheeses are gonna have a lower amount of carbohydrate, specifically, again, a lower amount of lactose, whereas softer cheeses tend to have a higher amount of carbohydrate. And then think about other types of milk products, things about ice cream, yogurt. 
it really depends on the product as far as how much carbohydrate is in there. You will have the carbohydrate present in the natural form of lactose, but then, especially for those processed types of foods, again, ice cream, yogurt, and so forth, you can have additional sugar added. So there can be a huge variance as far as the total amount of carbohydrate being provided by those types of foods. So let's note some of the additional sources of carbohydrate, or more specifically, those simple sugars or those added sugars that are often put into various foods that we consume, especially processed foods. One to note is sucrose. Sucrose, already mentioned, is referred to as table sugar. It's the combination of glucose plus fructose. It is the type of sugar that we routinely add to things like coffee, tea, maybe baking products. Another type is honey. Honey is the combination of sucrose plus fructose plus glucose. Some people consider it to be a more natural form of sugar. However, it still goes through a refining process. It still needs to be filtered unless you are um, specifically getting the unfiltered type of honey. As far as a positive with honey is that it tends to contain some antioxidants which have been connected with um, decreasing the risk of some disease processes. The next type to note is molasses. And molasses is that thick syrup which is produced when sugar is being refined. So when sugar cane, sugar beets are being refined to make sucrose, what's left over is molasses. Now molasses contains a few notable minerals and they include calcium and iron. Then we have brown sugar. Brown sugar is simply the combination of that molasses with sucrose or that refined white sugar. It tends to have a higher moisture content which is what gives it its very unique type of a um, texture. The next to note is high fructose corn syrup, which often is added to quite a few processed foods as well as to beverages. High fructose corn syrup is made from cornstarch and the way that it is manufactured produces a higher percentage of fructose in proportion to glucose. Now fructose is metabolized primarily by our liver. And what our liver likes to do is take this larger amount of fructose and turn it into fat. It favors what's known as lipogenesis. It will make triglycerides, it will make free fatty acids, and it'll make very low density lipoproteins. Now the glucose, which is present in high fructose corn syrup, is only metabolized by the liver by a small extent. Other cells can take the glucose and utilize it for other functions. A positive with that glucose component too is that glucose suppresses the hunger hormone. So it can trigger us to stop eating. Fructose, especially the larger amount of fructose in high fructose corn syrup, has no effect on suppressing that hunger ho hormone. In turn, what happens is that we don't have that signal to stop eating. Possible consequences? Well, if you're going to overeat, it increases your risk of being overweight as well as becoming obese. It will also increase your risk of heart disease as well as diabetes. In a moment, we'll take a look at the connection between these simple sugars that I just noted, or so-called added sugars, especially in the role of health effects. But first consider this. One teaspoon of sugar is equal to 4.2 calories per gram. It doesn't matter if it's a teaspoon of sucrose, honey, molasses, brown sugar, or high fructose corn syrup, all provide us with the same amount of calories. Now having this knowledge will enable you to determine how many teaspoons of sugar 
is in a product when the grams are given on a particular food label. Take a look at a can of soda, a typical can of soda that's 12 ounces. If you look at the label, it says it contains about 40 to 50 grams of added sugar. Using the equivalent of one teaspoon of sugar being approximate to 4.2 calories per gram, you can determine that there are about 10 to 12 teaspoons of sugar in that one ounce or that one 12 ounce serving of soda. Now you would never think of just sitting down and consuming 10 to 12 teaspoons of sugar, but that basically is what you were getting from consuming that one can. Look at a label on a Hershey bar. There it tells you that there is about 26 grams of added sugar. Again, simply using that conversion of 4.2 calories per gram per teaspoon, you can determine that there is at least six teaspoons of sugar in that particular candy bar. We consider these types of foods to be under the category of being empty calories. But we also have to look at foods that are designated as possible healthy choices. Take a look at the label on some yogurts, especially the yogurts that are fruited yogurts, or even more specifically, the kids' yogurts. Some of them may have up to 20 grams of sugar. Again, using that conversion, you can determine that they can potentially have about four and a half to five teaspoons of sugar per serving. So certainly be checking those labels to see how much of the simple sugars you're actually getting. Some of the health effects that have been determined to be associated with our dietary intake of these added sugars can be quite alarming. There is an association with the consumption of excess sugars and the increased incidence of obesity, hypertension, body inflammation, diabetes, heart disease, as well as dental caries. In the United States, about 50% of the sugar we consume comes from natural choices. So the simple carbohydrates that we find in things like fruits, veggies, milk, as well as grains. The remaining 50% though comes from added sugars. Why is there so much sugar being added to our foods? Well, added sugars obviously are being placed in there for taste, but they are also placed into food for other reasons. Texture. In some foods, sugar can add a bulking type of a quality. It can also play a role in inhibiting the growth of micro, uh, microorganisms. It can give a boost to yeast fermentation. So it's put in there, like I said, for other reasons just besides taste. General recommendation is to check the labels on the foods that you are selecting. Look at the ingredient list. If sugar is listed after the fifth ingredient, there is a good chance that there is a lesser amount present or a more acceptable amount for you to be able to work in to a healthy lifestyle. What then is the recommendation as far as how much carbohydrates we should be consuming? Well, the first to note is that the dietary guidelines encourage in general reducing added sugars and incorporating more complex carbohydrates. The RDA for carbohydrates is 130 grams per day. And this number comes from research which has shown that the average minimum amount of glucose that we need for our brain on a daily basis is 130 grams, approximately 130 grams. What has also been determined is that we need a minimum of uh, 50 to 100 grams to prevent a prolonged state of ketosis. Remember, by getting adequate dietary carbohydrate, we then don't have to rely on breaking down our protein stores or our muscle mass to then be used to turn amino acids into glucose. The dietary reference intake gives us a suggestion of 45 to 65% of the total calories we are consuming to come from, once again, carbohydrates or complex carbohydrates. 
As an example, if you're consuming about 2,000 calories per day, the recommended intake is about 225 to 325 grams um, of carbohydrate. The American Heart Association has a recommendation when it comes to added sugars. They recommend a maximum amount of added sugars for men as 37.5 grams per day, which would be equivalent to about nine teaspoons. For women, recommendation is 25 grams of added sugars per day, which is equivalent to about six teaspoons of sugar per day. To help manage blood glucose levels for diabetics or to help in some aspect of weight loss or weight maintenance, or even to reduce the risk of dental caries. There have been various sugar alternatives or sugar substitutes um, which have been developed and are available on the market. Review the following slides, slides 29 to 31. These sugar alternatives or substitutes that we do find on the market in the United States are summarized. You'll know a sweetness comparison to sugar, common uses, as well as a few potential health concerns. Acceptable daily intake levels are also noted. The ADIs were developed with the assumption that all substances at some point can potentially be toxic. So by using this limit as a guideline, it's thought that you can decrease the incidence of some type of an adverse effect within your body. I do want to make a note about the last sugar alternative, which is noted, um, which is stevia. Stevia actually isn't an artificial sweetener because it comes from a natural source. Compared to the other ones that were noted, they are more chemical based. Stevia comes from an herb that's harvested from a specific shrub, which is grown in South and Central America. It's been in use for many years in other countries and more recently is now available in the United States. It's about 300 times sweeter than sugar. It doesn't have true approval by the FDA yet. It's still being studied. However, it is on the grass list, which is the generally recognized as safe list, which the FDA puts together. Some of the brands that you will see on the market for Stevia include Trubia, Purvia, as well as Ribiana. And it really can be a healthier choice as far as a sweetener goes compared to, once again, the chemical-based alternatives. The last category of carbohydrates, or specifically the complex carbohydrates that we are going to take a look at, are the fibers. Now the fibers are polysaccharides, meaning that they are long chains of glucose units all linked together, just like starch as well as glycogen. However, as I noted back at the beginning of the lecture, where our bodies have the capability of breaking down starch, we can't break down fiber. We lack the specific enzymes necessary to hydrolyze the molecule. Fiber forms the structural components of plants as well as helping it to retain water and protecting its seeds. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes are very concentrated sources of fiber. We're also going to take a look at two categories of fiber. They're divided up into whether they are soluble or whether they are insoluble. We looked at this slide at the beginning of the chapter, but let's just review it once again. You can see we're comparing here a molecule of starch to a molecule of cellulose, cellulose being a fiber. 
Note the difference in the bonding between the glucose units. The way that starch is bonded together, or the individual glucose units are bonded together, we have the enzymes present in our gut to break that apart. However, with cellulose or any type of a fiber, because of the complexity of the bonding of the glucose units, we don't have the enzymes to break it down. For that reason, fiber cannot be a source of energy or a source of calories for us to use. The first category of fibers that we're going to take a look at are the soluble fibers, which very simply means they're soluble in water. They're referred to as being viscous, meaning they form a gel when they come in contact with water. These soluble fibers also have the capability of being easily fermented which means that they can be digested to some extent by the bacteria in the colon. Because of this type of bacterial digestion, there's the potential to form a very small amount of short chain fatty acids, which can then be used as a small source of energy for our liver and colon. Again, note, however, Fermentation is not the same as a complete digestive process. Once again, we cannot fully digest fiber because we lack the enzymes to break it apart. The examples of soluble fibers include, first of all, hemicellulose, although there are some hemicelluloses which are also insoluble. Hemicellulose is predominantly found in grains such as oats, barley, and rye, as well as various legumes. Another type of soluble fiber are the pectins, and these are found predominantly in citrus fruits. So think oranges, grapefruits, limes, and lemons. Apples are another good source of pectin, as are various vegetables. Gums and mucilages are also another type of soluble fiber, and they're a little different than the other types in that they are secreted at a site when a plant is injured. So if a plant might have a stalk cut off, it tries to repair itself, it tries to heal itself, and at that site it will secrete a gum or a mucilage. Some examples of this type of fiber include things like guar, bun, guar gum or locust bean gum. The last type of soluble fiber to note is psyllium. Psyllium is derived from the seeds of plants and it's very, very commonly used as a laxative as well as a food additive. Even though we can't break down fiber as a source of energy, there are positive health effects to know. Soluble fibers have been shown to potentially decrease blood cholesterol. It can help to bind bile, and the bile in turn can reduce the amount of cholesterol that ends up in your bloodstream. Overall then, it can help to reduce your risk of heart disease. Another positive effect of soluble fibers includes that it can slow stomach emptying. So it can provide a feeling of fullness for a longer period of time. This indeed can be helpful for someone in regards to weight management. Another positive effect is that soluble fibers can slow starch breakdown. This in turn can delay glucose being shipped off into your bloodstream. So for someone who is diabetic, consuming adequate amounts of soluble fiber can really be beneficial to control blood glucose levels. Another positive effect of soluble fibers is that they can help hold moisture in the stool, which in turn is going to help add bulk and going to aid in the elimination process as far as having regular bowel movements. The second category of fibers are the insoluble fibers, meaning they are insoluble in water. They then are referred to as being non-viscous, meaning that they don't have that gel-like capacity that the soluble fibers do. They also have 
little possibility of being fermented by the bacteria in the colon the way that the soluble fibers do. Examples of insoluble fibers include, first of all, cellulose, as well as some hemicelluloses. These are usually the primary constituents of the walls of the plant itself, and you will find these types of fibers in various fruits, vegetables, grains, as well as legumes. The second type of insoluble fiber are the lignans. And these are found usually in what we refer to as the woody parts of vegetables. So think about the stalks and the stems. You will also find lignin in very small seeds of fruits such as blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries, the type of seeds that you find right on the surface of those particular berries. The third type of insoluble fiber that recently has been added are the resistant starches. These are found in foods such as raw potatoes as well as unripe bananas. Then cooked potatoes, cooked pasta, and cooked rice that have been chilled has the ability to produce resistant starch. The digestible starch found in those types of cooked foods will actually turn into resistant starch during that cooling process. You'll see in a minute the positive effect of these resistant starches as well as the other types of insoluble fibers. There are also specific health benefits to note with these insoluble fibers. They can speed up fecal passage, increase fecal weight, aiding in elimination as well as alleviating constipation. Other benefits, there is a potential to reduce the risk of diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, colon and rectal cancer. It's been shown that these type of fibers can help to bind any potential carcinogens or cancer causing agents which may be present in the colon. Therefore, there's an association with reducing the risk of that colon and rectal types of cancer. Insoluble fibers also have the same benefit when it comes to providing you with a feeling of fullness as the soluble fibers. It can help to slow gastric emptying, so it can also be very beneficial for weight control. Usually when there are positive effects noted, there are a few negative effects to note, and fiber is no exception. Abdominal discomfort, gas, diarrhea can occur when you increase your fiber. You might also induce a GI obstruction, especially if you increase your fiber very quickly without ensuring there is adequate fluid or adequate hydration. Another potential side effect is that if you consume greater than 40 grams of fiber per day, there is a chance of interference with nutrient absorption, especially various minerals. So how much fiber should we be consuming? Well, there is no RDA set for fiber. However, the dietary reference intakes, the DRI, has a suggestion of 14 grams per 1,000 calories per day. So that would be equivalent to maybe someone, someone who's consuming 2,000 calories. Their fiber requirement or recommendation would be 28 grams. If you just want to think about an acceptable range, Various health organizations usually have a recommendation between 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. Unfortunately, in the United States, the average American consumes closer to about 10 to 15 grams per day. So you could see it really is a category that a large majority of people really need to work on. What are some good sources of fiber? Well, fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, such as oats, barley, brown rice would also be a really good source of fiber, as well as any type of a bran food and legumes, the dried peas and the dried beans. Something to uh, note 
once again, however, is that as you consume your fiber intake, you really want to focus on increasing your fluid or your hydration. You want to make sure that there's adequate fluid available, especially for the soluble fibers, to keep everything moving through your GI tract at an appropriate pace. The last slide will provide you with some examples of fiber-rich foods, giving you an idea of how much fiber is in a particular serving. Hopefully we can all start to focus on incorporating healthy sources of this very important complex carbohydrate because of the various health benefits that we've discussed.